Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Dr. Joseph Warren Historical Society interviews with prominent authors, historians, and scholars specializing in the colonial period. Now, my name is Randy Flood, and today I'm joined by my colleague, Christian Despigna, author of Founding Martyr, The Life and Death of Dr. Joseph Warren, the American Revolution's Lost Hero. This segment is brought to you by the Real American Revolution television series, public television series, actually, and the American Revolution Consortium for Civic Education. So, Christian, why don't you introduce our guest today? Thanks, Randy. Our guest today is Jane Triber. She's the author of A True Republican, The Life of Paul Revere, published by the University of Massachusetts Press. Jane is an independent historian and author who has regularly lectured at Boston area historic sites and appeared in documentaries and on C-SPAN's book TV discussing multiple topics in American history and culture, including Paul Revere, the American Revolution, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's influence on American history and literature, and the military history of the Boston Harbor Islands. Jane, welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to be with you today. So I just want to dive right into it. And I know you wrote extensively about the difference between the social standing of Dr. Joseph Warren and Paul Revere. But can you tell us a little bit about their friendship, their relationship in some, in, in, in some detail? Um, I often use Oxford English Dictionary as a historian's tool. And when you look up the word friend in the 18th century, it has two meanings. One is the meaning that we know it's a relationship among equals. But friend in the 18th century also means a patron, somebody above you socially who will open doors for you. Um, Revere's relationship with the other revolutionary leaders, John and Samuel Adams, is more of the second category. They are above him socially. He is an artist and he works with his hands. If you look at the Copley portrait of Revere, his fingernails are dirty and jagged. I always tell people, you don't see it in the reproduction. You have to go up really, really close when you're in the museum. But with Dr. Warren, he has a relationship that he doesn't have with the other revolutionary leaders. Yes, there are differences. Warren is a Harvard educated physician. Paul Revere went to the North Writing School. He learned reading, writing, and arithmetic, and his education ended probably at the age of 13. But because of their connection as members of Freemasons, uh, the Masonic organization, I think that allows them to cross what would have been boundaries of class in which they never would have known each other. So I do think he does have um, what we would consider the closest to our conception of friendship. That's what he has with Dr. Warren. You know, and I just wanted to follow up quickly because I've often wondered, you know, you, I don't want to say Revere fell out of favor, but do you, let me word it this way. Do you think had Dr. Warren survived the Battle of Bunker Hill, would Revere have gone on to do maybe greater things or have more of a presence in this Whig orbit of radicalism? Yeah, I mean, it's what if history, we can't prove right. it, but definitely he was disappointed. He wanted to be a colonel in the Continental Artillery. He didn't get the position. In, uh, in 1777, he wrote a letter to John Lamb, a friend who was a New York son of liberty and did get a commission in the Continental Artillery. And he wrote to Lamb, I have never been taken notice of by those whom I thought were my friends. I shall have to be contented in the state service. He means John and Samuel Adams. And I did find a letter from John Adams, basically apologizing, saying he tried to get a commission for Revere, but basically everybody in his cousin wanted a continental commission and there simply weren't enough to go around. Had Warren lived, that may have made the difference. Um, Revere was very much disappointed by that. Interesting. Well, Jane, Christine and I have been discussing in previous interviews and with other authors and historians, the smallpox epidemic in Boston in 1764. What was the experience of Revere and his family during that outbreak? Well, there's a famous letter when he talks about that he will not send my little lambs to the pest house because he knew if you send his kids to the pest house, which was basically, there was no medical care, it was just a place to warehouse people so other people didn't get it, that his kids probably wouldn't survive. Um, what I liked in my research about Revere is, um, how shall I put this nicely? Um, Revere has a rather strong personality on being kind. I found several episodes where he can be very um, abrasive and very strong in his opinions. And I'm picturing him arguing with the selectmen and apparently he wore them down. They allowed him to keep the children at home uh, and there would be a flag on the house saying they were under quarantine 
and a guard, and the kids did survive. We, we don't know for sure if it was one of the boys or one of the girls, but everybody survived the epidemic. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you really, uh, one of the things I really admire about your book is you really went into great detail about Revere's life really after the revolution. Talk to us a little bit about what his relationship was like to medicine, science, education. Um, like a lot of people who didn't have that much formal education, education was very important to Revere. Uh, when he writes his letters, he crosses out words all the time. He wants to get it just right. He makes sure that his younger children get the education he never had. When he goes from being a silversmith to um, basically owns a foundry, he makes church bells and cannons. He becomes the first person to successfully produce what's called cold rolled copper. His younger children benefit from that. His boys go to Boston Latin. His younger daughters, Mariah and Harriet, uh, have a very good education. And his younger son, John, fulfills all of his aspirations for gentility. John goes to Boston Latin, a private school, Harvard, and University of Edinburgh. Revere himself very much tries to improve himself. Um, I found receipts. He actually subscribed to 11 different newspapers after the revolution to be well informed. He also, as a metallurgist, was self-taught. He actually read Watson's chemistry, which is the standard text. Taught himself chemistry. This is a guy whose education ended at the age of 13 and even had the audacity to write to Watson with a correction about colonial money. And I'm picturing Bishop Watson saying, who is this Paul Revere? <laughs> um, as far as his post-revolutionary career, he was um, president of the Board of Health in Boston. He was the coroner. Um, he subscribed to a, a library. Boston had a circulating library. He read stuff to try to improve himself. And I've often wondered if his relationship with Dr. Warren played a role in his son John becoming a doctor. I don't, there's no letters in which I can prove this, but Revere seemed to have greatly admired Warren as a man of science, a gentleman. Um, and I wonder if that had any impact. And he himself tried mightily to improve himself through self education. Mm -hmm. Well, Jane, you just mentioned uh, Revere's son, John. Tell us some of the parallels between him and Dr. Warren, if you will. I haven't thought about it for about 40 years. When I wrote to the Paul Revere, um, visitors used to ask about Revere's children. So we did research and I, I studied the boys and my, uh, one of my colleagues studied the girls. And when I actually, I pulled the paper out when I was talking to Christian and I was struck by how much they had in common. Um, John Revere and his, the obituaries talked about him as a man of humanity, like Dr. Warren, uh, healing the sick. He actually died supposedly treating uh, some of his students for typhoid. Um, he had a remarkable career. Like Dr. Warren, he was kind of a medical pioneer. He taught in, first he went to Baltimore. He did a lot of work in um, public health. He actually edited a, a medical journal in Maryland. He translated Magendi's Physiology, which was the standard work of the day. Then he went to Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia. He made some, uh, many um, actually advances in chemistry and he ended his career at New York University Medical School. And I've actually been there and I've seen the portrait of him. And he just reminded me of Dr. Warren, a man of science and a man of gentility. Um, he, he wrote about, his, he felt his students were like his children and when they were in medical school away from their parents, he felt it was the role of the faculty to be surrogate parents. Uh, and it's just, I had never, I hadn't thought about it for a long time, how much it reminded me of Dr. Warren, who treated people from all walks of life, whether they could pay or not, was very much interested in scientific advancements like smallpox inoculation. And John Revere reminded me very much of Warren. So I, I, I have a, a flurry of questions running through my mind right now that I want to ask you. <laughs> you, you. You really, you covered so much in the book. You talked about how Revere and Warren lost their wives within a week of each other. You talked about their relationship to Freemasonry. The, the one thing that I've always wondered, and, you know, I saw you a, a while ago. You did a, you did a special on Paul Revere, and I think it was an A&E documentary. Am I correct about that? And I remember you, you know, you... You talked along with some other experts, and I remember one of the gentlemen had said, you know, we almost can't describe the phenomenon of why Paul Revere has endured throughout the years. Like, really, he's a household name. And, you know, you and I had talked a little bit about before the interview, and I brought up that book by uh, Melville that was called um, 
Israel Potter. And it was based on a real uh, autobiography that Israel Potter had written. And it was, he, he's a veteran of Bunker Hill. And the book is written, I think about seven, eight years before Longfellow's poem. And I've often wondered, you know, the book talks about Bunker Hill. It talks about a Bunker Hill war vet. And I just wondered what the connection between Melville, because Warren's unofficial widow was Mercy Scully, who was Melville's aunt. So can you break it down for us? Can, can you give us any insight as to what this whole phenomenon is with this Longfellow poem and, and how did it affect Revere's enduring fame? Because really, when you think about it, you know, Revere goes on the midnight ride, but it's Warren who sends him, yet it's Revere that, that has this fame and this glory and really Warren has taken a back seat. Can, can, you, can you enlighten us here? I feel like I should apologize to you, Christian. <laughs> um, definitely, the, the one word answer is why is Revere famous? It is Longfellow. I'm from Revere, Massachusetts, by the way, which is the town of Romney Marsh in the 17th century, then Winnesimmet in North Chelsea. Longfellow published the poem in the January 1861 issue of Atlantic Monthly, two years later in Tales of the Wayside Inn. By 1871, a town meeting in Revere voted to name themselves in honor of Paul Revere of revolutionary fame. Um, Longfellow was very much a student of history. Um, his house had been Washington's headquarters when he took command of the Continental Army in Cambridge. Longfellow was a member of the Massachusetts Historical Society. Um, Revere's accounts of the Midnight Ride were in the Mass Historical Society. It's very possible Longfellow read them. He's very vague about the research he did for the poem. But I always like to say the poem is really more about the impending civil war than the revolution. Longfellow is deeply saddened, disturbed by the slavery crisis, both he and his wife Fanny. And you can see his comments in his journal. So he visits the Old North Church in April of 1860 with George Sumner who's the brother of his close friend, Senator Charles Sumner. And he describes climbing to the steeple, which he writes is now the home of innumerable pigeons. And he reflects about what happened in April 18th and 19th, 1775. That's the beginning of the poem. I think a lot of the poem has to do with the romantic revolution in American literature. One person can make a difference and change history. So he kind of boils down everything that went on. The role of Dr. Warren, the role of the other writer, William Dawes, the role of the people who wrote him across the Charles. And it, there's a whole network of people who were involved in this. Um, and Revere becomes the lone hero. It's a beautiful poem. He knows it's, it's a poem and it's not history. He actually makes a joking reference about that when a descendant of Dawes uh, accuses me of high crimes and misdemeanors, Longfellow writes. And definitely the poem made a difference. Revere was, I, I would call him um, a secondary revolutionary figure in his own generation. Um, he's a pillar of the community. His writers written about very accurately by Richard Frothingham and George Bancroft, as 19th century historians. But the Longfellow poem catapults him from the ranks of history to the ranks of folklore. And it definitely made all the difference. Yeah. And, you know, uh, there's so many things I could ask you, but I, I really, I have to say, when the book came out, I, I really, I, I grabbed it. Uh, it's kind of frayed. This is the book, A True Republican. Can, can you talk to us about anything you're working on now? I mean, I know you had mentioned something you were just working on. Any research um, you're doing or? I still work, so I, and I don't work in, in the academic world, so I don't have, a, I, I'm, I'm working on different smaller projects. Um, I've been doing more legal research over the last couple of years. Um, I've written about government and politics in the early Republic. I wrote a textbook chapter for high school and college kids. And I got very interested in analyzing the constitution as a pro-slavery document. And then that kept bringing me back earlier and earlier because you can't understand why the founding fathers wrote this document without understanding how pervasive slavery is. So I've been doing a lot of reading and thinking about um, legal statutes and I've even then I've gone forward into the antebellum period and so I'm, I'm kind of gone into the 19th century we've gone back to the 17th century and forward to the 19th century so I'm working on a couple of different smaller scale projects and I still do public speaking as well right so you've been time traveling yes yes <laughs> you know and one of the th one of the joys of interviewing you and I've seen you give talks 
really when when you when you give these quotes to the letters you you really bring the history to life when I, when i hear you talk i actually can see revere writing these letters or being a little grumpy or i mean i i just think you really do a phenomenal job i thought you did a great job in the book because you really i mean you know so many people just think about revere in this midnight ride and there was so much more to him particularly after the revolution and i thought you did a great job of fleshing that out well, I, I don't like to paraphrase because their use of language is much more emotional than ours. I mean, in, in, in Faneuil Hall, when they're talking about the taxes that the British are imposing, they're saying things like, this is slavery, this is tyranny, and it's, I'm thinking, oh my God, you people own enslaved people, how can you even say that? But it's very emotional and packed, so I, tr I always try to use their words, and um, because this is not just an intellectual issue. This is an emotional issue. I mean, when I looked at Revere's involvement in the revolution, I looked at his books, I examined his lectures. Why did Revere join the cause of liberty? And what I found was his income dropped dramatically from 1764 to 65, from over 100 pounds. When they passed the Stamp Act, his income drops to 60 pounds. There is definitely an economic motivation. Um, he uses language very, very powerfully. He's um, a very strong-willed person. Um, he takes his honor and reputation very seriously, and if people question it, he uses very emotional and powerful language. Um, there's a great story. He made church bells after the revolution, and he made a bell for a church in Worcester, and the three members of the committee came up to Boston and took possession of the bell, bring it back to Worcester, and they mount it in the church steeple, and they have the audacity to write a letter complaining that the sound was kind of tinny they weren't satisfied with it and revere writes what i call a dear idiot letter he writes that um i have made 20 bells that are considered the equal of anything made in england and i've never any complaints before and it would take me too long to explain the science of acoustics to you in parentheses because you're idiots and he actually draws a diagram of how they should they should have hung it and he ends by reminding them payment is due within 30 days. So that's what I love about him. He's so, <laughs> his language is so emotional. And he takes, because the thing is, there's an economic reason. In the 18th century, the economy is based on reputation. People pay you with a, with a note, with a bill. Now, if it gets around that Revere makes bells that are inferior, nobody's going to do business with them. That's why he, re and, and 21st century people may not get that. Like, relax, Paul. What are you so upset about? But they could undermine his reputation, and nobody will order a bell from him. Interesting. Interesting. Well, as we wrap up, uh, Christian, hold up Jane's book one more time for our Absolutely. viewers. I mean, go ahead. Give me a plug. There no, you go. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, hey, it's so, been out for 20 years. You can get it on eBay for a buck. And you want to know something, Jane? That's the point, because you, you really are a Revere scholar. And I mean, this scholarship doesn't go away, all the research. I encourage anyone with even a vague interest in the revolutionary period, Dr. Warren, Paul Revere, you, you really need to get a copy of this book. It really, I think it's an excellent book. I think, I think you did a great job. I mean, it was fun to read, I, you know, so we, we were really thrilled that you, you agreed to come on the show. I, you know, I know we talked about maybe uh, doing a little tune, but maybe if we all drink a little bit and we have you come back, maybe you'll <laughs> sing a song or maybe we'll join in with you. Yeah. You're Jane. that seed of science, Athens, and its proud mistress, Rome. Unfortunately, I am out of rum. I believe I have an eighth of a bottle of Merlot. Right, we're going to send you <laughs> a bottle and we want you to come back. Will you, will you promise us to come back? Sure. I'm so happy to see people. I'm so happy to see people. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Jane Triber, thank you so much for being with us. And uh, thank you to our viewers. Uh, tune in next time for when we do another interview with a historian, with a scholar, with an author. On behalf of the Dr. Joseph Warren Historical Society, we've been interviewing Jane Triber. There's the book, The yes. Republican, about Paul Revere. And we're delighted to have her with us. And Jane, come back again. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jane. Yep. It was a real pleasure. Yep. Same here. Yep. So goodbye for now, everyone. <laughs>